So tonight I will address the subject of my talk uh, through the lens of my transdisciplinary collaborations uh, with an interest in developing an alternative uh, material practice in architecture through the generative fabrication of the nonlinearities of material and form across disciplines. I'm going to start by talking very briefly about the foundation for this work, and then I'll talk about three projects. Now, certainly biology presents useful conceptual models for architects to consider, where form is in constant adaptation with environmental events. Here, geometry and matter operate together as an active elastic ground, a datascape, an overlay that steers and specifies form, function, and structure in context. Through direct references to the flexibility and sensitivity of the human body, I'm interested in developing adaptive materials and architecture where code, pattern, environmental cues, geometry, and matter operate together as a conceptual design space. It is the embedding of material systems with biological relationships and behavior to generate models that are at once natural and also artificial. On a meta level, this marks a shift away from Cartesian formal, formal orders of thrust of column, beam, and arch, and towards interiorities, networks, fabrics, and topological meanders that are pliable, plastic, and open. Now, I was fortunate to uh, be at Penn during a very formative and exciting time and was a founding member of the Nonlinear Systems Organization in which uh, many colleagues, some of which are here tonight, uh, took, took part in where we brought together not only architects but scientists to engage in a number of discussions through conferences and exciting workshops. With an interest in engaging complexity in the context of architecture through a rigorous investigation of scientific principles. It was during that time that I also co-founded Lab Studio with Dr. Peter Lloyd-Jones, a longtime collaborator at UPenn, and we also started uh, a seminar that was housed within the Graduate School of Architecture titled Nonlinear Systems Biology and Design, where we paired postdocs and fellows with graduate architecture students in the context of the lab setting. And uh, Masako's in this, this image here, you can see. There we go. I was also part of the International Smart Geometry Group uh, at its inception and still am uh, very active within it in which uh, practitioners, academics, researchers uh, from industry, practice, and academia come together annually to engage in computational design discussions in formally looking at the production of one of the very first pieces of parametric software, generative components. And this group very much keeps me on my toes in terms of technology and its impact on the built environment. Now, in addition to these important foundational underpinnings, I've also been influenced by linkages between textiles and computation as they give rise to the possibility of generative fabrication. The technological and cultural history of weaving offers architecture a potent and useful relationship between design and digital fabrication. We could even say that mechanized textile processes, especially weaving and knitting, are the first examples of 3D printing. Now, the coupling together of architecture and textiles is not a new idea. Modern and historical examples that come to mind include the seminal and vast bodies of artistic and design work by Annie Albers, Gunther Stoltz, and Lily Reich, to name just a few. Importantly, the Bauhaus weavers marked a shift from expressionistic and individual handcraft compositions to mass-produced and rapid, prototype, rapid prototyped examples for furniture, interior design, and architectural elements. This shift led away to a new approach to craft and making, one that was marked by the integration of pattern, material constraints, form, and fabrication, and perhaps offering up one of the very first analog examples of generative and parametric design, work in the context of scaled prototyping and fabrication. The women in the weaving workshop at Dassau embraced the capabilities of the most current mechanized new looms of the day and integrated this with a mathematical, computational understanding of pattern and form generation. 
The pliable plane was Annie Albert's term for this generative intersection between architecture and textiles. And indeed, this pliable plane is a landscape of information made tangible through geometry and matter. Now, as, as with the My Thread Pavilion by Jenny Sabin Studio, seen here, and Foyer Tapestry, my work diversifies into linkages between computation and the binary natures of weaving and knitting that influence parallel innovations, including digital space and, and the contemporary computer. Foyer Tapestry, which was produced in 2006, is based on the Foyer series, a binary mathematical sequence for the analysis of sound, which is woven in wool and synthetic threads using an early computational model for computers, the Jacquard loom. Now, Foyer Tapestry is generated from mathematical models that transfer sound, color, and harmonic systems and dynamic data from the human body into woven designs. This woven design is then transferred to the CAD CAM interface of a digitized Jacquard loom. And this process seeks to understand and intuit spatial patterns within data sets, patterns that through study and analysis lead to architectural elements in the form of textile tectonics. And this was on view in Artist Space in 2006, along with Hedge. Now, this dynamic space is also biological. Another seminal reference for my work, which was introduced to me early on by Dr. Peter Lloyd-Jones, is the biological extracellular matrix. It's a dynamic protein network that physically and chemically couples the exterior environment of cells with their interior and vice versa. This matrix environment is a cell-derived, woven and globular protein network, an architectural textile of sorts a biological model of Annie Albers pli pliable plane. Now, importantly, as I've come to learn from my collaboration with the Jones Laboratory, this environment changes dynamically throughout development and disease. And we're specifically interested in models that show how these alterations feed back to control cell and tissue behavior at the level of code, DNA, and beyond in multiple dimensions, including time. Now, another longtime collaborator who's here tonight, Dr. Xu Yang, has, has also been very inspirational and influenced a lot of my work that we are engaged in collaboratively. And her interest in biomimicry, in looking to nature for models to extract and synthesize principles in the production and fabrication of new materials, looking at the wings of butterflies to understand how pattern and structure influence material effects at a human scale. Now, in discerning which effects and materials are actually scalable, my practice and research operates across three phases. The first includes new tools and novel methodologies for modeling complex biological behavior. Now, the second entails architectural prototyping at the human scale, and the third operates at the scale of ecological building design. In one project, we developed advanced imaging and scripting procedures to model networking behavior of cells, and this project titled Branching Morphogenesis, which may be familiar to some of you, uh, which was produced in 2008, investigates part to whole relationships revealed during the generation of branched structures formed in real time by interacting lung endothelial cells. Now, the study and quantification of this network allows for a greater understanding of how variable components might give rise to structured networks in both biology and also architecture. This was also a slow process. So what started out with a series of sophisticated digital investigations then became very analog in my interest in slowing down the process of visualization. And in that slowness, could we see something anew? And how might we begin to grapple with the problem of scale, understanding how we as humans might inhabit these datascapes? And the installation overall, which was originally on view at Seagraph in 2008, materializes five slices in time that capture the predicted force network ex exerted by interacting cells upon their neighboring matrix. I should say one of the most important points for me in the production of this project came about a third of the way through um, its fabrication when the director at the time of the Institute for Medicine and Engineering, Peter Davies, came over and was absolutely blown away by the fact that each one of the, the cable zip ties represented a data point. And no, it didn't represent truth, but it allowed for new points of entry, new questions, and a way to inhabit the data that was scalable. 
And I'd like to talk about one of the most mature projects um, stemming from the research uh, that spans disciplines, eSkin, which is multi-scalar design ecologies. In 2010, we were one of 10 teams across the states to secure a National Science Foundation grant within the Emerging Frontiers for Research Innovation umbrella. And this $2 million grant in includes uh, multiple collaborators, uh, PI, Dr. Xu Yang, at the start, Dr. Dr. Peter Lloyd-Jones, and now Kayuri Aihita Stansbury, Jan and Nader, and of course my team at Cornell now with Andrew Lucia. Now fundamental to the call was to bring together collaborative teams that would rethink the whole problem of sustainability, our conceptual approach to the problem, how might we begin to look to nature for models such that how to look at how buildings themselves could begin to behave like organisms in their environments. Now our emphasis rests heavily upon the study of natural and artificial ecology and design, and especially in observing how cells interacting with pre-designed geometric patterns alter these patterns to generate new surface effects. And what you see here is a single cell, the nucleus stained in blue, lassoing its cytoskeleton up and around these pillars produced on a PDMS substrate. So this dynamic reciprocity between environment and code became a point of departure to think about passively responding building skins at the building scale. Now, no, we weren't interested in placing human cells on buildings, but really to begin to harness how these tools and modes of design thinking, how they could be applied towards the design and engineering of passively responsive materials and sensors and imagers, the cells being stand-ins as a set of biomimetic principles for the production of these sensors and imagers that could learn and adapt in real time over multiple time scales and multiple environments. Now this is an example of a predefined geometric uh, pattern embedded within a shape memory polymer material displaying structural color change under deformation and recovery. Now some of the limitations that we're up against obviously include scale. Uh, currently, we're limited to four inches in maximum um, within the e-skin sample. Now, our role as architects on the team, importantly, it also involves the speculation of the material at an architectural scale, in addition to producing models for visualization and simulation of these biological and material behaviors. Now, our research is focused upon the optical properties of these materials, and though these qualities can be seen by the naked eye, as you can see here, Extracting their optical performance quantitatively for speculation at larger architectural scales is absolutely necessary. And as I mentioned, our role involves generating tools to visualize and simulate cell attraction forces and cell behavior based upon proximity to various constraints. These are some very early diagrams and tools developed um, by Mark Nickel, who I think is in the audience such as looking at forces distributed via a virtual extracellular matrix environment over multiple time states while also incorporating material constraints coming forward from Dr. Yang's lab, the material scientist on the team. Now, obviously, central to the project and our original proposal is the reduction of the overall carbon footprint in the built environment, while also addressing important social and community-based topics that arise through large-scale transformations of building facades against environmental constraints. So not only do we seek to contribute to sustainable green building design, but we hope to inspire excitement between disciplines and responsibility around the topic through beautiful spatio-temporal effects. Now beyond vis visualization, we also direct the architectural intent of the project, as I mentioned, by constantly speculating as to how the results at a nano to micro scale will potentially look, feel, and assemble at a building scale. These are some of the most recent speculations uh, looking at the opportunity for the production of a tunable window. When one stretches a piece of this e-skin material, one can begin to inflect change in the areas of transparency as well as color in the context of structural color. We're also interested in the issues of, of haptic response, how one can begin to tune their own environment in looking at the topic of personalized architecture. And here you can see a local response based on sensing um, uh, 
a interior sensor and a, in tune the actuation of a shift in color. We're also interested in global responses, looking at ambient incident light, as well as multi-directional um, incident light from solar um, angle dependence. Currently, we're looking at how context, occupancy, and environmental factors become stimuli for change. And in the last year, we've been focusing our investigation into the production of a series of prototypes, again, with an interest in speculating which effects are actually transferable. Now, this prototype was looking at um, also at the human scale and input um, stemming from one's interaction with the prototype. And to maximize the color changing effect and efficiency calculation, uh, the simulated geometry was approached as a tessellation, as you can see here, of panels that respond to people's movement in front of a video camera serving as a sensor. Now, each panel can be treated as an individual surface with a single light source of uniform distribution with each point on the surface having the same optical properties. And here we're actually work, working with simulation data of the e-skin material in real time. Go ahead and play this. Now at its inception, this color data appears generic, but is given specificity per simulated viewing angle. So here the incorporation of the human in the context of the simulated optical uh, material data is very important. Now, the second prototype that we recently uh, finished, we worked on this for about a year, uh, was, our, was also a part of the recent Archilab exhibition at the FROC in Orléans, titled Naturalizing Architecture. This prototype aims to advance speculative design trajectories within the ESKIN project as a physical, interactive, and scaled component prototype whose properties behave in a comparable manner to those observed at a nano to micro scale, but which can be fabricated at the human scale. And these were some of the early speculations as to how this would actually operate. This is a view of the internal um, makeup of the prototype. And what you see here are an array of components of two ITO uh, glasses per uh, component, and a, which are sandwiched with a solution of nanoparticles. And so here we're working with basically just two parameters, color change and transparency, with an array of sensors that detect shifts in light intensity. And here you can see um, the finished piece, which as I mentioned was on view uh, in the exhibition at the FROC. So in the case of the second prototype, we were able to test changes in color and to some degree transparency, as you can see here through nuanced environmental stimuli, including multiple participants and changes in light intensity, um, in terms of looking at a day to night um, sequence within the gallery, that in turn affected features of the prototype in both regional and global ways. And what these actually are, are colloidal nanoparticles, and what is occurring when one passes their finger or hand across the sensor array, the sensors detect a shift in light intensity, which in turn sends a very small electrical charge regionally, um, which in turn changes the packing density of, this, of the colloidal nanoparticles, which in turn changes color. Now I'd like to shift into that second phase in terms, of look, in terms of looking at the topic of generative fabrication and architectural prototyping through the lens of two projects, which I'll close with. Now, early on uh, in Lab Studio, we were fortunate to acquire, um, at the time, one of the largest powder-based printers, a Z-Corp printer. And I was interested in working with a 3D printer not as a representational tool, but as a way of rapid prototyping multiple components. We were interested in embedding biological behavior and process into these non-standard components interested in maximizing the possibility of the print bed through multiple arrangements of components, looking at multicellular structures and their potential application uh, in non-standard ways. And this is when my background in ceramics came in in a very productive way. I thought I had long, had long since left that knowledge behind, uh, but in the last five years, it's come back in a very um, exceptional way. And what you see here was one of our first successful attempts at the direct 3D printing of 
clay greenware parts. So tinkering with this machine was incredibly important. So we simply extracted the proprietary powder-based media, uh, composed our own recipe of a high-fire uh, dry clay, clay body, a stoneware, with some organic matter, sugar, and maltodextrin to facilitate the printing process and moved away from what cost about $600 per bucket to about $2 per bucket. Now this set up a sort of parallel strand of inquiry um, under the lens of digital ceramics. Here you can see the same part printed with the regular powder-based material um, and then also printed uh, in greenware, bisque-fired, and then glaze-fired. That research uh, has been formalized in the context of a series of seminars, the first of which started at Penn, uh, and the last two have been at Cornell, titled Digital Ceramics, Experiments in Building Construction Techniques which led into one of the most mature, mature applications of these investigations and core research, most recently in the context of the project Polymorph, which was also part of the ninth Archilab titled Naturalizing Architecture at the Frock. Now, my years of investigation into networking behavior, particularly within human cells, looking at how endothelial cells network in their context, in their dynamic extracellular matrix environments, certainly influenced this large spatial structure, but moved into an investigation mathematically, looking at issues of feedback and recursion, understanding how one begins to spatialize a node, how one begins to look at um, points aggregating into clusters, moving into surfaces, moving into volumes, and understanding how one can begin to abstract and extract those principles into a family of components that can interweave, moving from what's soft and pliable into a calcified scenario. There were just three components that had the possibility to interweave in multiple ways, ultimately developing two surfaces, which were put through a number of iterations to understand how they could become volumetric and spatial. Now, importantly, I was very interested not only in looking at the connections and interweavings of these components in the context of the studio, but we were also very interested in looking at how structure, how changes in compliance, tension, etc., would influence the design process. The installation is now permanently housed within one of the turbulences at the FROC. Uh, the first one that you see here as you enter the new uh, building designed by Jacob and McFarlane. And in this case, we utilize the 3D printer uh, not to directly print the components, uh, but to actually optimize uh, for two-part molds in the context of slip casting, some of which you can see in the exhibition outside. So those positive molds were then used in the studio to produce multiple uh, plaster molds, approximately 20 each. I hired two sculptors with uh, expertise in ceramics to lead the production. Uh, alongside with the oversight of Martin Miller. And here you can see that actively occurring in the studio. There are over 1,400 uh, individually hand cast ceramic components. And here you can start to see how those were connected. The installation was quite slow and involved a number of people, including uh, a series of uh, local architecture students in France. I think we took away the award for the longest installation process. <laughs> I think it took us approximately three weeks. And this gives you a sense of how we installed the, the, um, the overall project, where you can see here a series of swaths that were locally tensioned, attached to their neighbors, and the, and the curvature that began to develop. Um, and running internal to each of these slipcast parts is a continuous network of steel cable and continuous tension, so all of the ceramic components are held in compression, and it's housed within this turbulence here. And some views of the installation as it started to take shape, you can sort of start to see these lacy calcified interweavings and surfaces starting to be produced. The implied curvature that emerged through shifts in compliance as well as tension the interweavings, uh, the three inversions, so it's not just a hollow shell, it actually has an interiority to it, and some final views of it installed.
Now I'm going to conclude with the, the last project, uh, the process and product of which is on display outside, the MyThread Pavilion, which was a commission that came uh, came to me from Nike Inc. as a part of um, a new technology that they had innovated, which is essentially knitting shoes. And they invited six people from around the globe uh, to essentially riff on these, these new technologies that they were developing and their associated benefits, uh, looking at issues of performance, lightness, uh, flexibility, et cetera. And out of the six people, I was the only one that was actually interested in engaging knitting head on. And I was very interested in, in the context of the pavilion project in forming a bridge between the complexity of the human body, mining the human body, particular data, set, data sets as an active ground that could then influence, steer, and specify a series of uh, produced knit structures in the context of a new type of digital fabrication. Now, at the onset of the project, although I knew quite a bit about weaving, I didn't know a whole lot um, about knitting. And so I brought on a new collaborator, uh, Anne Emling, who's a textile designer and who at the time was based at RISD. And so before we even began uh, to produce simulation models, in, before we began to embed the data sets that we worked with, which I'll come back to in a moment, we actually just simply looked at the parameters that we could work with what could be possible in terms of beginning to scale, scale up the inherent qualities of knitting into an architectural scenario. And so we spent a weekend with Anne and my team producing a whole series of prototypes on both mechanized as well as digital knitting machines. Again, looking at issues of transparency, scale, how far could we push the boundaries of the knitting process. And that led to a series of workshops that were organized uh, here in New York City as a part of that were housed at Nike Stadium in the Lower East Side. The first workshop was essentially about collecting uh, data, and the second workshop was about making sense of that data, where we had a whole series of uh, areas of expertise uh, where participants could produce their own data sets, work with the bio data that we had collected from the original workshop, and then use that to drive a series of patterns that could then eventually be knitted on site into a series of, of models. Now, I was also very interested in extending the in inherent expressions and structures of the data sets that we were working with uh, through the incorporation of a series of high-tech yarns. We worked with photoluminescent yarns, solar active yarns, and reflective threads, along with a base material. And so we took all of these findings from the two workshops, um, where I, I should mention that in the first one, we sent about 30 participants out into Manhattan. They were outfitted with a series of sensor bands. We collected that bio data and used it as a way of, to begin to steer and specify the knitted structures. And these were some of the initial simulations that we developed, uh, where you can see here highlighted in color the gradients of data as they began to infiltrate uh, the, the knitted structure and their, their elements. Now, I was a bit naive uh, in thinking that we could find a knitting manufacturer uh, quite quickly and uh, went through a laborious process of, of many, many uh, meetings that did not go so well and eventually ended up working with Shima Siki. And they're at the cutting edge of what's called whole garment knitting, which allows one to knit seamlessly three-dimensional elements, which was provided a, a perfect opportunity for us to begin to expand upon the initial models that we had been developing early on in the studio. And these were some of the first initial uh, prototypes, uh, successful prototypes that we worked with. And a few diagrams highlighting the process where we started out with a very simple geometry, a conoid, a cone. Began to look at how they could aggregate and come together. And how that then eventually informed a, a kit of parts, a family of components. Where we then began to infiltrate and embed the data sets that we had collected not really as necessarily as a mapping, but as, a, as an, an opportunity to begin to look at gradients, to look at how the inherent structure and expression of that data would then influence the flow of tension across both geometry and matter, and ultimately influence how we began to interface this new type of fabrication technology alongside our, our collaborators at Shimasiki. 
Now, the overall pavilion moved from a sort of harder outer shell, an array of water jet cut aluminum rings, which were held in tension, which provided homes for each of these knitted cones and the overall fabric structure. And these are some images of the final installed uh, pavilion. Here you can see in the inter interstitial zone between the, the aluminum rings and the overall fabric structure. Some initial sections and plan with the Nike Stadium. Now, once we had knitted all of the individual elements, and this was an extremely fast project, I think we did all of the knitting in approximately two and a half weeks. Uh, they, we then worked with a local uh, fabric finisher, uh, Daisian uh, Fabrics, um, who helped us seam together all of the individual elements. Again, a very slow and analog process. Uh, here you can see working one-to-one, -one, one of the biggest drawings I think we've ever produced in the studio. And the final fabric structure starting to take shape. One of the best things about this project is that it weighs about 150 pounds and fits into a single canvas bag. And this is how we actually installed it. So we, we actually tuned it very much like one would tune a drum uh, to avoid any um, tears and rips in the, the, uh, the overall fabric structure as it settled into, into shape. And so what you can see here is a, a view into the interior, which people were able to inhabit, and the elliptical tension ring taking shape at the base here. I worked with a lighting designer, uh, Benji Kane, uh, where we simulated a day to night sequence over the course of an hour. And in this view, you can see the photoluminescent threads activated, as well as some of the solar active threads being activated too. And a view on the opening night. We also incorporated windows. That was part of the budget that we had to cut out. Um, so there was an array of windows that you can see here, sort of shallow tubes. There were two doors that um, allowed visitors to enter uh, the, the interior portion of the, the pavilion. And then later, we were fortunate to receive another commission from Nike and had the opportunity to take all of this R&D into, a, yet again, a very fast project, a much long, longer structure that was installed in Berlin. And so I'd like to conclude with the following. Now, while the, the exploration of biological and nano to micro scaled material properties and effects at the human scale forms the starting points for many of the featured projects, some of which are featured in the exhibition, the disciplinary hurdles that we encounter through the production of projects across scales culminate in what is perhaps the most potent deliverable, a new model for transdisciplinary collaboration. The scalar constraints that we encounter span material science, cell biology, textile engineering, fashion, sport, electrical and systems engineering, and architecture, which in turn challenge the differences between fundamental and applied research. Through the collaborative production of these applications, we encounter key differences between the conceptualization and materialization of the projects whose success demand that science, engineering, and design meet. The creative navigation of this ambiguous line between science and architecture in turn offers up a unique model for collaboration across disciplines that we hope defines a new future for architecture and the role of the ar architect, where authorship is horizontal, giving way to an interiorities, elastic networks, fabrics, and topological meanders that are pliable, plastic, ecological, and open where geometry and matter are steered and specified by the flexibility and sensitivity of the human body. Perhaps the most important deliverable to date is this new model for collaboration across disciplines, where the topic of overlay as an active datascape forms a bridge and a point of departure. Thank you. <laughs>